One of your longest ones, switch, but... Uh, switch, switch, switch the cameras off. Very accurate. 208. Yeah. See the stance. It's all wrong. <laughs> In the pond that time, never mind, it's the, di it's the distance that, uh, that matters. So we can take a look and check on your distance, I think. 208 yards for you, Nigel. Oh, so 266, 250, 208. Stevie Crab. I don't believe it. Now I'll tell you that on a Hang good on. day with a following win, this boy can play golf, because I've played with him. You forgot the left-handed clubs, Des. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing. Hold that, Rob. <clears throat> you see how the boys that I watched, Nick had a little practice first. Oh, yeah, that's the, tech, that's the secret, it seems. So it's a long way away, you know, Steve. Well, I've been looking for a new career after last year, so... Uh... <laughs> no heckling, please. Go on. I'm nervous enough as it is. Yes. This won't detect my slice, will it? It probably will. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think... 194 yards, though. Not necessarily in the right direction, but... <laughs> definitely need a glove, Des. Definitely you do. I'm sorry about the lack of bat right equipment, but off you go. Let's see what you can do with this one. Oh, that was better. Oh, that's a cracker. That's a cracker. That's a bit better. That's an absolute cracker. You're good. 215 <laughs> yards for Steve. Right, Frank. <laughs> Frank, let me hold. Oh, he's got the club, right? <laughs> Frank, uh, Frank only needs a putter, really. But anyway, off. I'm a bit rusty. This. Don't worry about the rustiness, right. Frank. It's all for a jolly good cause, this. I tell you. Is that how you hold it, Henry? <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't have Henry because he is a left-hander. Right, right. Off you go. <laughs> I think. <laughs> yes. One more go, Frank. Yeah, so... Now take it easy, so nice and calm. Two lessons, you know that. I know that. I know. <laughs> that's that's my excuse, and I'm we... sticking to it. <laughs> we shouldn't have asked. Go on. <laughs> hey. There is. I'm, I'm looking closely, Frank. <laughs> One more go. One more go. Turn this that way, Steve, you're putting me off. <laughs> hey! Hey, it went, it went, it's registered. No, it hasn't. Bless you, Frank. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> It actually registered that one, Frank, because the club head went through the electronic pulse or whatever the heck it is. Anyway, there we are. Now, Laura. Laura Davis. <laughs> Got to play with the man's clubs, I'm afraid, Laura, but... Uh, oh, it's OK. You're happy enough. Never had a lesson, I believe, have you? No, not yet. Never had a lesson. Now, watch this. I need one after this. <laughs> Oh, nearly drove the green. Look at that. Over the lake. Two, two, one, three. Have another go. Two, six, six is the uh, longest so far. Okay, okay. Mr. Faldo. Oh, straight down on the road. Well done, Laura. Now. Now, there we are. Well, in our little competition, Nick Faldo won it. But that doesn't really matter, because the total yardage is 1,308 yards. And, of course, we mentioned earlier that John Joe O'Neill uh, has formed a charity for cancer, and we would like to donate the equivalent sum in money out of the BBC coffers to John Joe to start off his cancer appeal. And you've all been most helpful in doing that, and great sports. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Now, 
enough of football, it was centenary year, 100 years of the Football League, and perhaps the mood of celebration would help the game sort out its problems on and off the field. At international level, we now know the route to the 1990 World Cup finals, and the likes of Peter Beersley and Kenny Sansom have to brush up on their Albanian, but England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have managed to avoid each other in the draw. Let's hope they all make it to Italy in 1990. But in 1987, the priority for the home countries and the Republic of Ireland was qualification for the European Championship Finals. There were cheers, not jeers, for the England manager in a year when his team showed a cutting edge that smoothed their path to the finals of the European Championship. And there, Bobby Robson will have an amiable English companion in Jack Charlton whose Republic of Ireland team also qualified for West Germany next summer. Thanks partly to heroics in Dublin from the likes of Kevin Moran, and then more dramatically to the intervention of a Scotsman, substitute Gary Mackay, whose 11th hour strike in Bulgaria brought smiles as wide as the Irish Sea. But the Welsh had to grin and bear it. They found themselves edged out by Denmark. LPR scored, Rush didn't, and Wales again missed out at the final hurdle. At home in the first division, goals like this from Kevin Sheedy made Goodison Park a cheerful place to be, as Everton overtook Liverpool in the championship race and secured the title at Norwich on Easter Monday. It was Everton's second championship in three seasons, a fond farewell for manager Howard Kendall as he left for Europe. George Courtney's whistle signalled immense relief at Burnley, who survived the dreadful trapdoor of relegation from the league by winning their final match. There were tears of joy here, tears of a different kind at Lincoln. They were replaced by Scarborough, who made a solid start to life in Division 4. Life in Italy tempted away Ian Rush, but not before he said farewell to Liverpool in the way he knows best. Well, here coming across, he's left Rush. But George Graham's arsenal grabbed the Littlewoods Cup. Sanson. Anderson. Adams. Nicholas off the post. Anderson. Yes, it's gone in. Charlie Nicholas has done it. Groves. He's away from Gillespie. Nicholas and Rocastle in the area. Nicholas. Yes! He's the body prince this afternoon. But the king, north of the border, was Graham Souness, who led Glasgow Rangers to their first Premier League title for nine years. Thanks to a considerable English connection. Yes, Butcher, he scored. Butcher has scored for Rangers. Rangers threatened to corner the market, but in the Scottish Cup, Ian Ferguson and St Mirren showed there's still room for the corner shop to please its customers. But for once, St Mirren's compatriots, Dundee United, ran out of stock, beaten in the UEFA Cup final by Gothenburg. Porto and Ajax were the other European winners. David! David Phillip! John Sillett and George Curtis were the managerial partnership of the year, injecting fun, finesse and fame into hitherto unheralded Coventry City. When they faced David Pleat's Tottenham in the FA Cup final, Coventry were tilting at their first ever major trophy against a club who'd won seven FA Cup finals out of seven. It is for Allen! Can I have Allen? Would you believe it? Bennett! David Bennett! 1-1! One, one. And Goff's there, and Allen was there. Regis joining him. Oh, Mabbitt! It's an own goal! What a proud moment for this Midlands club. The sky blues are sky high. But on the Spurs bench, hearts were on the floor. David Pleat resigned in October, 
to be replaced by Terry Venables, hot foot from Barcelona via Florida, and hailed as the new wizard of White Hart Lane, the magician and his scholar. But how can Venables disturb the monopoly of Liverpool, who ran away from the rest of the first division thanks to some vintage football, notably from John Barnes? Barnes won it. He won it from Brock. He's got Beardsley going to his left, but still Barnes! That's a fabulous individual goal! And what Barnes has been doing for Liverpool, he has at last shown he can also do for England. Oh, and Barnes came in! What a start for England! But when it comes to international goals, there's only one Gary Lineker. And Lineker has scored another hat-trick for England. Gary Lineker, still over there. Terry Venables is now over here, finding life a little bit difficult at Tottenham, beaten by Charlton today. What was the story of that? Well, we didn't play well, and we, in the end of the day, we, we got beat, but uh, we were a bit disappointed the way it went, but uh, we've got to keep going. You played the bottom side and the top side now. I don't yeah. know how far you think Charlton are going to go, but Liverpool, can you see anyone to challenge them in Well, I think it's, it's the same old story. A remarker would have gone half the season, still not been beaten. And uh, you can see some of the stuff they've shown there, a remarkable side, and they've been for, for a lot of years now. And you and Tottenham will have a fair old crack at them over the next couple we of years? We hope so, we hope so. Keep my fingers crossed. Good. Missing the sunshine? Uh, well, it's a little bit cold out there tonight. Um, I'm missing it a little bit, but uh, we'll get over it. Nice to see you here. Terry Thanks. Venables. Thank you. Now, here's the bit you've all been waiting for. The bits that we studiously try to avoid, but don't actually mind when we don't. Defending champion, of course, is Murray Walker. Where are you, Murray? <laughs> Nigel, first of all, will you carefully and slowly take your hat off? You've got an enormous bump on your head. Can you, can you let them see it? I don't know where they Right up there. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. Brett Ogle deliberately hit his putt past the hole to reduce the distance that it would come back towards him, only to find the cup between himself and the ball. Let's go back now to that Oxford-Watford game. Tony Gubb has got news of it. Tony, you want to on the Lady, and she's a big one. Oh, oh my foot! <laughs> Bernie, it's some 17 years since you bought McLaren. You've had some good times and you've had some bad times. What do you remember best? I don't remember buying McLaren. <laughs> This is pretty silly. I don't remember David Coleman doing a lot of this. <laughs> I'm moving up into fourth place. That was tremendous. Do you think you'd ever do that? I never thought that. No, from eighth to fourth, it was brilliant. But he deserved it, the way he showed you. Yeah. Oh, he was sick, wasn't he? he? Absolutely. I couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> the first time in 10 years that we haven't had a, a woman challenging for the 100 metres or 200 metres. And that's because, sadly, Kathy Cook's retired from the game. And, Ka you know, she's from the game. boys have improved a bit since then. <laughs> but we're close to the moment now when we announce the 1987 Sports Personality of the Year. The postal vote, as ever, was enormous, and as a result of that vote, these six emerged as leading contenders. And here they are, in no particular order. Good evening from 
the England captain. Faldo is the champion, and congratulations to him. Great Britain is in business. Oh, what a great moment for Ian Wisdom. So let's now find out who you at home have selected as the 1987 Sports Personality of the Year. To make the announcement, the man who very fittingly scored a century against Australia on his 100th test appearance for England. And then there was Cowdery, applauded all the way in, from on the field as well as off it. Now becoming the first man ever to play in a hundred test matches. And the next day, there was an encouraging crowd to watch them as Cowdery came slowly but fittingly to a hundred in his hundredth test match. Welcome, please, the president of the MCC in their bicentenary year, Colin Cowdery. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, there's been a marvellous year for British sport. So many proud achievements are superbly replayed and highlighted tonight. Uh, television brings the big occasions live to enormous audiences across the world today. And I marvel that our great champions here tonight keep their cool and handle it so well. And not surprising that every now and again, uh, the pressure of it all gets too much uh, and overspills. And if I may be just serious for one moment, I think I speak for all the champions here tonight and every true sportsman in Britain when I say that as we play fiercely to win and in the words of Ian Woosnam, to be the best in the world, there are three vital responsibilities we hold and not always easy to attain. First, we must bring humour. Second, we must be mindful that old-fashioned codes of sportsmanship do matter. And third, and appropriate perhaps at this moment, we do have to be sensitive to the role of the umpire. The officials, whether they be umpire or referee in all sport, have to work hard and gain the respect of the players so as to ensure that players respect the authority of officials. It's a two-way deal and top-class sport is at its best when this mutual trust can be achieved. And now, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me enormous pleasure uh, to announce the winners of this uh, marvelous award in reverse order, if I may, and I'll invite them to come up here. And in third place, uh, Mr. Ian Woosnam. And in second place, uh, Mr. Steve Davis. Well done, Steve. Congratulations, marvelous. And in first place, the winner that you have chosen. Ms. Fatima Whitbread. Well done, marvellous. Congratulations. Congratulations. Well done, very, very good. Marvellous. Well done. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, uh, including the viewers at home, 
I feel very proud and honoured to uh, be receiving this uh, BBC Sports Personality of the Year Award and I thank you all very much for voting for me. Naturally, I was very proud to have uh, won Britain its only gold medal at the World Athletic Championships, but I feel sure that my colleagues and I will do our very best to uh, bring back gold for the 1988 Olympics. I wish you all a happy Christmas and everything you wish for in the new year. Perhaps have a little wish for me too. <laughs> The 1987 BBC Sports Personality, Fatima Whitbread. From all of us in Television Centre London, good night. Sports Review of 1987 will be shown again on Thursday afternoon on BBC Two, starting at two o'clock. It's the Christmas edition of Radio Times, and it's packed full with the stars of Christmas on BBC Radio and Television, including Les Dawson. Now tell me, flexibility of the legs. How's that? All right, this one. How's that now? In the breaks in the festivities, try a Radio Times Christmas competition. Then, how about a Christmas drama? Do you fancy Bergerac? I'm afraid, sir, she has been identified as a jewel thief. A jewel thief? An extremely clever one. What about a feature film? There are nearly 90 to choose from, including Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Water! 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 Find it all in the Christmas and New Year double issue of Radio Times, out now. There's a sporting theme to BBC One's drama in 15 minutes, based on an uproar in Yorkshire cricket circles over the sacking of the county's controversial batsman. Our Jeff follows the news now from Maurice Stewart at five past nine. Backing Gatting, but England cricket bosses may face more rows in Pakistan. Thousands of women could now win compensation from the makers of a contraceptive device. Bob Geldof returns from Africa. The war against children must stop, he says. And after years of protest, a champagne celebration at Molesworth Air Base. Good evening. England's two top cricket officials have said that Mike Gatting's job as captain is safe, despite his row with an umpire in Pakistan. Raman Sabaro, the Teston County Cricket Board chairman, and Alan Smith, the chief executive, said as they flew out to Pakistan this afternoon that they had complete confidence in him. But it seems the row about umpiring may not be over. Reports from Karachi say the Pakistanis have chosen Shakil Khan, the man who made a number of controversial decisions in the first test, to officiate in the third test starting on Wednesday. Mr. Sabaro and Mr. Smith say they'll leave it to the tour manager to decide whether to make a protest if Shakil Khan's appointment is confirmed tomorrow. Two senior figures in English cricket are flying out to try and repair relations with the Pakistani officials and with their own team. If Mike Gatting felt he didn't get enough backing from Lords last week, he's certainly getting it now. I don't think there's any question about his future as captain, frankly. Um, I, you know, people have short memories. Uh, it's not so, only a few months ago, he was the greatest thing since sliced bread and doing a good job. Um, I have every confidence in Mike Gatting as captain. I don't think that, um, you know, we're talking about in, this, in, in the sense that we've got any question marks on it. But it's not just the English team who are bitter. The Pakistani players too feel hard done by. Imran Khan, their recently retired captain. The players feel that when they go abroad, 
and when they have problems against the umpiring abroad, it's considered to be uh, uh, bad sportsmanship and uh, whinging. And when teams come to Pakistan and they, they are, uh, uh, when our umpires make mistakes, it's considered cheating. So, I mean, there's a strong feeling about that. And I feel that the answer to all these problems is neutral umpiring, and I don't understand why it hasn't come in cricket. And that question of umpiring seems likely to come up again. Shaquille Khan won no friends in the England team when he umpired the first test, and the news today that he's probably going to stand in the next one won't make Subba Rose and Smith's mission any easier. They say they want to sort out England's problems over a beer, a challenge in itself in a strictly Muslim country, but they'll have bigger difficulties than that over the next few days. After a two-year legal battle, thousands of British women who claim they've been harmed by the Dalkin Shield contraceptive device are now hopeful that they may win substantial compensation. A judge in the United States has instructed the manufacturers, A.H. Robbins, to set aside the highest amount ever ordered for medical compensation. Margaret Gilmore reports. The Shield, an intrauterine device, was withdrawn from sale in 1974 after allegations that it was causing serious infections and even deaths. Now the American company which made it has been ordered to set aside nearly two and a half thousand million dollars for claimants injured by the device. In all, about 300,000 claims have been made, 3,700 of them from British women like Gabrielle Lewis, who continued using the contraceptive here after it had been withdrawn from the American market. So it was in for about 18 months. Um, and then I had very bad salpingitis, which is inflammation of the tubes and ovaries, and was admitted to hospital and was there for about three weeks um, with very bad infection and was told when I was discharged from hospital that um, I might not be able to have children, that it might have blocked my fallopian tubes. In fact, that's what had happened. Um, I found out later because I tried to have children and we've been going to infertility clinics since then and I've had operations and tried to test your baby twice. In 1979, a support group was set up in Britain to help women like Gabrielle fight their case. We're optimistic, A, that there will be a quick resolution now once a sum has been agreed, and that the British women will be treated in the same way that the American women are treated. We have every reason to believe that, that they will be. And do your lawyers think this too? Yes, our lawyers... The lawyers that advise the association have been in touch with American lawyers acting for British women. And they, who are not given to false optimism, are very optimistic now. Bob Geldof, the founder of Band-Aid, has returned from his 12-day tour of famine areas in Africa. After visiting Ethiopia, he flew on to Mozambique. There, he was told of the torture and mutilation of children by right-wing rebels fighting the government. He said that the famines in both Mozambique and Ethiopia were worsened by civil wars. And he condemned the conflict in Mozambique as one of the dirtiest wars going. Bob Geldof returned to London today, sickened by the atrocities committed by the rebels in Mozambique against young children they'd captured. He met 28 of the children in Maputo, one an 11-year-old whose father the rebels had murdered. He said, where is, are your father's friends? And he said, I don't know. So they got a blunt knife and cut off his little finger. And then they said, where are your father's friends? And he said, I don't know. So one by one, they cut off his fingers with a blunt knife. And he still didn't tell them. And they then sliced off his ear. The rebels have abducted many young children, like little Augusto, and forced them to take part in killings and torture, some made to shoot their own families. Geldof said the Mozambique authorities are now trying to rehabilitate the child victims of war to whom brutality has become a way of life. You really forget their children um, because they're just dead and serious. And it takes them a long time to speak to anyone, a long time. And um, they are so ashamed of what they've done. I mean, it's, it's awful. President Shisano of Mozambique told Geldof his government was trying to use not only military but political and diplomatic means to end the war. The president praised Mrs. Thatcher in particular for playing a positive diplomatic role in trying to dissuade American senators from supporting the rebels. And he praised Geldof for bringing his country's plight to the world's attention. 
There's been a fifth consecutive day of unrest in the occupied West Bank and Gaza Strip. Palestinians say at least 30 demonstrators were injured today in clashes with Israeli troops. The Israelis say five civilians and six soldiers were hurt. At Hebron, an Israeli vehicle was petrol bombed and demonstrators stoned soldiers at a refugee camp near Nablus. A total of six Palestinians have been killed since last Wednesday. The scale of the disturbances and the fact that they've been going on for five days have led a number of Israeli commentators to wonder whether the unrest in the occupied territories is entering a new phase, whether civil disturbances are developing into full-scale civil revolt. Military and other leaders have been quick to deny this. While things may not have got to that stage, they certainly do seem to have developed into what one newspaper here has called an epidemic of spontaneous chain reactions. Sporadic clashes were reported in many areas. Palestinian hospital sources say they treated up to 30 people for bullet wounds and for the effects of beating. Some of the wounded were taken to hospitals in Israel. Hundreds of thousands of Spaniards have been taking part in a series of demonstrations against terrorism, which has claimed nearly 40 lives since the summer. The biggest demonstration was in Saragossa, where a huge car bomb killed 11 people on Friday at the Civil Guard barracks. Five of those who died were young girls. About a quarter of a million people, led by the victims' families, walked quietly through Saragossa to a central square, where they observed a minute's silence. However, there was anger behind the calm. Some carried banners calling for a return of capital punishment. The city is still trying to recover its balance after the dreadful events of Friday morning, but by and large the march was orderly and dignified, punctuated with the occasional anguished cry for revenge against Edda. The police think that Friday's bomb attack was planned in southern France and carried out in a lightning raid. People in Zaragoza have been astonished by reports that an Edda suspect, arrested more than a fortnight ago, had told the police that the civil guard barracks in the city had been chosen as a target. The future of the Belgian Prime Minister, Wilfried Martens, hangs in the balance tonight. With 16% of the votes counted in today's general election, it's clear that Mr Martens' centre-right government has lost seats to the Socialists. But it's not yet obvious whether he has lost his majority. The election was caused by a language dispute. Belgium has a number of language-based parties, and that could make negotiations to form a new coalition government very complicated. In South Africa, two black policemen have been shot dead in the township of Soweto. A police spokesman said four other black police were wounded when their patrol vehicle was fired on as they were returning home after a shift. Only one man in the vehicle escaped injury. At Round Rock in Texas, there was an explosion and fire after a train carrying liquid propane gas became derailed. About 5,000 people had to leave their homes. And to